Remain standing for the reading of God's word, John chapter 11 and verse 45, reading to the end of the chapter. This is the fifth scene of the Lazarus narrative. Let's hear God's word then, John chapter 11 and verse 45. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all. Nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. Jesus, therefore, no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there to the region near the wilderness to a town called Ephraim, and there he stayed with his disciples. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and many went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. They were looking for Jesus and saying to one another as they stood in the temple, What do you think, that he will not come to the feast at all? Now the chief priests and Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he should let them know so that they might arrest him. Amen. Let's pray. Reveal now to us, Lord God, the glory of Christ, even in these dark moments that were a prelude to his own death. Show us, Lord God, that you do not work or think as we do, but that your ways are better and higher than ours, and that your ways are all right and just and glorious. Work in us then, Lord God. Work in us faith and trust to the praise of your glorious name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, I hope over the last four weeks you've been blessed by the Word of God, the Lazarus narrative as it is before us. We've seen that God's ways indeed are not our ways. He doesn't do things in the way that we expect Him, or in fact often the way we would want Him to do those things. Yet we've seen, have we not, that His ways are good. They are loving. They are wise. They are powerful even when we feel that we ourselves are breaking under the load of trial uh, of life, God remains almighty, all-powerful, and nothing is out of his control. But we would have to ask ourselves if this John 11, in fact the whole, the whole of the gospel, but John 11 particularly, if this is about the manifestation of the glory of Christ, How do we see that glory manifested in this fifth scene, verse 45? What do we have here? We we have actually a large-scale rejection of Christ's ministry. We have a plot which will, within a week or so, in John's narrative, end in the death of Christ. How do we see the glory of our Savior in this plot, in his execution, in this apparent large-scale rejection of his ministry. To human eyes, we don't see glory. We see failure. We see a lack of success. If we see anything, we see that it is inglorious. Not glorious, but for John's gospel, this is the moment of glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the prelude to his moment of chief obedience, that is the cross. The moment of chief obedience, which brought to him the moment of greatest suffering, which in John's gospel brings to him the moment of greatest glory. 
the sufferings of Christ are not in John's gospel contrary to his glory, but they are actually the avenue by which he is chiefly glorified. And so it must be also, brethren, with the children of God. We must walk in the footsteps of our master. A servant, says our Lord, is not greater than his master. If you wish to be glorified like Christ, you must have something of a Christ-like experience in this life. Suffering precedes glory. Let's have a look at how this text reveals that to us. In verse 45 to verse 53, we see something of a mixed reaction to Christ's ministry. A mixed reaction to Christ's ministry, which then, in verse 54, is really the cause of Jesus withdrawing and ending his public ministry. We need to understand at the beginning of chapter 12, his public ministry is substantially over. Substantially, not completely, but substantially over. And he goes into a private ministry with smaller groups, chiefly his disciples. How then are we going to see the glory of Christ made manifest in what we would think are less than ideal circumstances? We see, first of all, a very mixed reaction to the raising of Lazarus. Now, if you will, place yourself at the scene, Bethany. You're there. The tomb has been opened. This man, Jesus, has cried, Lazarus, come out. And a four-day-old dead man has come out. What would your reaction be to that? Uh, I'm sure most of you would say, well, I saw a dead man come out. This must be Jesus. This must be the Christ. I'll commit I see it. I've seen it with my own eyes. And for some of them, verse 45, that appears to have been the reaction. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. For some, it appears that they had seen the miracle, the sign, and believed in the one performing the sign, which is always the purpose of signs, to validate the one performing the sign. For some, the, the sign seemed to have functioned in the way that it was intended. It was intended to engender saving faith in the one making the signs. They came, it seems, not to a natural conclusion, but rather to a supernatural conclusion, that the one performing the sign was, in fact, Jesus the Christ. You read different commentators, and they'll come to different conclusions on these people in verse 45. The problem is we've seen people believe in Jesus before, only to fall away. Chapter 8, verse 30. They believed in the Lord only for our Lord 14 verses later in that same chapter to say, you who believed, you are of your father, the devil. In fact, what it would suggest is a spurious faith present in John's gospel. And presumably there is also in this group a mixed multitude, those who believed some truly believed, some had spurious faith. But suppose that some truly believed that this was in fact Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. What could be more fitting? They came to Bethany to commiserate with the one who had died and the family of the one who had died. And seeing their Lord, they themselves were released from the power of death itself. That's what faith in Jesus Christ does. It releases us from the power of sin and the power of death. In Jesus Christ there is victory. The sting of death has indeed been removed. There's been in these people, if they are of true faith, an eternal category shift, if you like. They've been removed from the kingdom of darkness and brought into the kingdom of light. There's also actually a temporal category shift. No longer are their masters, the Jews, of whom we will read in one moment. They now have a new Lord and a new master, Jesus Christ. There appears to have been a positive reaction with some for others. There appears to have been a negative reaction. Look at verse 46, the very next verse. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. 
Scripture says that when a sinner repents of his sin, the angels rejoice in heaven. What was their reaction, I wonder, at this moment of gross hardening of heart? Having seen the Christ raise Lazarus, they hardened their hearts against the Christ. Remember what I asked you earlier? If you saw the miracle, if you were there at Bethany, would you believe Would you be all in with Jesus? The answer is simply no. Some of us wouldn't. Some of us wouldn't. Verse 46 very clearly tells us they saw the miracles of Christ and remained unmoved. In fact, they became hardened to Christ. And their purpose in going to the Jews, as one theologian writes, they went not to modify but to inflame the wrath of the Jews. They knew that when the Jews heard that Jesus had done this greatest of the signs in John's gospel, that would be the end of it for Jesus. They went with an agenda. They went to cause trouble for the Lord Jesus Christ. Brethren, can you imagine this? Can you imagine this dynamic? You see a man dead for four days, raised from the dead, and you remain in unbelief? Does it surprise you, brethren? It ought not to. It ought not to. There are lives unchanged every week. Lives that sit under the word every week. Lives that have seen other lives transformed and changed and delivered from sin. People remain unchallenged unchanged, sitting under the word every week. They remain in unbelief. These people can't even claim that the faith is incredible. I mean, they saw Lazarus come out of the tomb. They saw it with their own eyes. They were there. It's not incredible, it's credible. They've just seen the proof, but the reason they don't accept that proof is they're happy to dismiss anything that does not suit their predispositions, that does not suit their view of the world. And we see this all the time, brethren. People will dismiss anything because it doesn't suit them. My brother's a doctor back in Wales. A few years ago, he finished a PhD. He was talking to me about the process of testing his hypothesis through experimentation. And he said, we got lots of results which were kind of outliers. You know, they were were a bit troubling. I said, well, what did you do with these results that that didn't agree with your hypothesis? His, His response was, well, we ignore them. He said, that's the way science works. If it doesn't agree with our hypothesis, we simply ignore it. It doesn't agree with what we think, therefore we ignore it. Man is doing that spiritually all the time. All the time. That's the Jews' reaction to Jesus, and that, brethren, is man's natural reaction, even when confronted by a resurrection. The claim that people say, I'll believe it when I see it, is at worst an outright lie and at best gross self-deception. A.W. Pink says of this passage, what an example of incorrigible hardness of heart. Alas, what is man? Even miracles were to some a savour of death unto death. Had not our Lord already said such? Ironically, in Luke 16, the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Remember what they say, Father Abraham is there, and, and, and the brothers say to Father Abraham, uh, Luke 16 and verse 30, Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, the rich man, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And Jesus says this, If they do not hear Moses or the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone rises again from the dead. John 11, 46, the fulfillment of that saying. That's the reality, brethren, of total depravity. The reality of a heart that is set wholeheartedly, as it were, against God. It is the natural bent of of unsaved man to hate God, he's bent on unbelief and therefore he is bent on destruction and he will dispense of anything that is contrary 
to his own presuppositions. And this is what we see, brethren, in the Jewish council. Of all people, the Jewish council, verse 47, 48, 49 following. They gather a council together. They receive this report that Lazarus has been raised by Jesus, and they call the council, the Sanhedrin, made up of the chief priest, the high priest, some Pharisees, and the rest are mainly Sadducees. It's three of the main groupings in Jewish religious society gathered together for a council to deal with the Jesus problem that has been bugging them for at least three years or so. Now, notice their concerns in the text. Look there in verse 47. What are we to do, they say, for this man performs many signs? If we let him go on like this, here's the first one, everyone will believe in him. And secondly, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Now, ultimately, brethren, what they've said there is we need to protect ourselves. This is about self-preservation. This is about preserving their office, their position, their influence in Jewish society. And this is how it plays out. Notice, first of all, brethren, verse 47. For this man performs many signs. Oh, brethren, that's critical. That's crucial to our understanding of the heart of unbelief. They acknowledge the signs of Jesus Christ. They acknowledged the signs, and still they acted against him. No ordinary man can raise from the dead. They just received that report of Lazarus' resurrection, and still they acted against Christ. That's to say, because they acted against the evidence, first of all, they're prejudiced, and they are irrational. You need to understand that. Unbelief is prejudiced and irrational. And it reveals in them a heart disposition, in fact, a predisposition not to believe in Jesus Christ. Remember, ultimately, this is about their position. And that's revealed, secondly, in what they say there about the Romans. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. They're fearful that if a Messiah figure arose in their day, that the Romans would come in and just destroy all the paraphernalia that was left of Judaism. Uh, they They would absolutely put their imprint upon everything. Notice what they say, the Romans will take away our place and our nation. The Greek word there for our place is where we get the word topography from, topos in Greek. Uh, and, and usually it has a geographical connotation. And it probably does here. He's, they're probably thinking of the temple. They're probably thinking of Jerusalem, of, of Israel. But I think also, brethren, this is one of John's examples of a, a double meaning. Just like he says, the wind blows where it wills. He's talking about the spirit. The place they are most concerned with losing is their own place in Jewish society. It's their place of prominence their place of influence, their place of power. Do you see, brethren, why men will not believe? Listen carefully to this. You can dress up unbelief in any philosophical objection you want. You can dress it up in your experience of the church in the past that it's hurt you. You can dress it up that it's not supported by science or any other reason. The simple truth is this. Men do not believe because it does not suit them to believe. That is to say, instead of taking an eternal life and blessing as their reward, they want to keep their own supposed autonomy and position. They will not, in short, bow the knee to King Jesus. That's the heart of unbelief. A refusal to bow the knee to another greater authority than themselves. They want to be self-directed rather than God-directed. They want to keep their position rather than lose it and find favor with God. That's the heart of unbelief, brethren. A refusal to bow. A refusal to acknowledge the king. And the Sanhedrin of all people, the great irony of this, the most 
religious, as it were, of all the groups in Israel, turns out to be the least religious and the hardest of heart. But the question still remains, what are they going to do about Jesus? What's the problem? Enter the stage comes Caiaphas, verse 49 and 50. He's the high priest that year, and he interjects in this council meeting. Uh, This man, the high priest, stands in a singular relationship between God and man. You understand that, don't you? He's the one who could go into that holiest of places, no one else. He's the representative between God and man. But what's he found doing? uh, Obscuring that relationship between God and man. One writer says this. In the patchwork of Caiaphas's personality, the strands of brazen impudence, insane ambition, rancorous jealousy, and consummate cleverness are interwoven. He knew all the answers and he knew how to make others see things his way. He was the kind of individual concerning whom an old Dutch proverb says, the saucy person owns half the world. And in case you're wondering, it was a Dutchman who wrote that piece, so don't be offended. That's Caiaphas. That's Caiaphas. He is the one who provides the answer to the Jesus conundrum. Verse 49, you know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not the whole nation should perish. Notice what he said there. It is better for you, the Jewish leaders. It is better for you that one man should die than the whole nation perish under the anger of the Romans. This, brethren, is a plan of pure expediency and unrighteousness. What he's saying, basically, is the ends, that we can save ourselves, justify the means, the killing of an innocent man. Brethren, this plan in the hands of men is terribly cold, unrighteous, expedient, But thanks be to God that we know this was also the plan, and indeed chiefly the plan of God. For we read there in verse 51 that he did not say this of his own accord. This prophecy that he gave, verse 50, that one man would die instead of the nation, yes, it was his prophecy, he as the high priest was given the spirit enough to prophesy that reality that Jesus would die for the nation, But actually, in the hands of God, this is not a cold-blooded plan. It's a plan that reveals the love and the heart of God towards sinners. You see, this speech functions on two levels. One, it features, it reveals to us the cold-blooded murder of Christ at the hands of wicked men. But the second plan, the greater plan, reveals how God would deliver us from our sins. You see, this is not just a plot of man. It's an act of divine revelation. And yet Caiaphas did not know what he was saying. He thought he had prophesied a truth that one would die. But actually what's going on is he's prophesying a truth far greater than he ever even imagined. He spoke of what he knew nothing about. And so the Apostle John fills in the gaps for us, verse 51 and 52. First of all, he did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest, he prophesied. That's to say, the spirit worked in him, as the spirit can work in the unregenerate, Balaam in the old covenant, and others. He worked in him to give this prophecy that one would die for the nation. But actually, John goes on that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for the nation only but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. John tells us the prophecy, though it was evil in the hands of men, was good in the plans and hands of God. That God himself had said through this prophecy will come life, not just to believing Jews in the nation, but to all the Gentiles as well to whom God would call. 
We've seen how many times there's great irony in John's gospel. Here's another example of this great irony. They wanted to put Jesus to death in order to stop Rome destroying Jerusalem. Do you know what they did? They put Jesus to death and Rome destroyed Jerusalem 40 years later. And in fact, what was outworked was not their plan of destroying Jesus, but God's plan of salvation. That's what's going on here. We see something with our eyes, but the word tells us there's a deeper, fuller, more precious meaning to these difficult circumstances. And so let me ask you, brethren, are you working off God's plan or are you working off your own plan? You see, we don't always know God's plan, do we? God's plan is often revealed to us in the moment. Providence. Providence is God's most Holy, wise, and powerful, preserving and governing all his creatures and all their actions. And we learn about that plan when it happens to us. I crash my car in the providence of God. That's God's will for me at that point in my life. The question is, are we working towards that plan? Even though we don't know its details for the future, we know what underpins those details. Just like in this text here, we see the Jews plotting, but actually we see God working out a great salvation for Jew and Gentile. I wonder, brethren, can each one of you conceive today of a God who might order your affairs and order your lives that through the wickedness of other people, God might bring good to you? And God might bring good to his church even though he works through the wicked hands of evil men. Can we conceive of that God? You should do, because it's right here in this text. Peter says the same in Acts chapter 2, that Jesus was crucified by the hands of wicked men, lawless men, in order to fulfill the plan of God. Can you see that in your own lives? Not just in the grand scheme of life, but also in the smaller details of life. Providential hindrances, the things for which we, we have a habit of saying, I could really do without that right now. And yet God is saying to you, that's precisely what you need right now. This, my son, my daughter, is what you need. And that's what we fall back on in faith. We say, God has spoken. God has acted. It is of the Lord. And we bow in worship before him. Oh, brethren, if you can't work like that, then you're just subject to fate. Luck. Usually bad luck. And we don't believe in good or bad luck. We believe in the powerful providence and care of almighty God, ordering everything in our lives in order that we might see his glory, experience his grace, find peace and contentment in him. This is the glory of Jesus Christ being revealed to you right now, my friends. But because of this situation that has arisen, verse 54, I'll be quicker if I can, Jesus withdraws from his public ministry. There's a plan to kill him, verse 53. From that day on, they made plans to put him to death. But Jesus then withdraws and effectively ends his public ministry. Look at what it says in verse 54. Jesus, therefore, no longer walked openly among the Jews. Do we understand what that says, brethren? Jesus no longer walked openly among the Jews. That means he said, enough is enough. I've done signs. I've lived among you. I've preached and taught. I've healed. And you've rejected me. And now the time has come for me to say, I am rejecting you. What a shocking statement. What a shocking statement this is. That our Lord would withdraw from people because of their unbelief. 
It's a great lesson to any here today, to any here today who have heard the word many times and still live in unbelief. Your time is running out. There will come a time where Jesus will not walk openly or speak openly in front of you, and then it'll be too late. Now is the time of repentance and faith. The people also are looking for him, verse 55 and 56. Will he come to the Passover? Will he not? Will he make himself known? There's a mixed reaction. There's questions. There's doubts. What do you think, brethren? What do you think of the Lord Jesus Christ that has been shown to you in John chapter 11? The people there had seen this greatest of miracles, the raising of Lazarus. Some believed Some felt compelled to betray him. His imminent death, which which is coming just probably, it appears within a week or two after this event, is not a spontaneous act of passion by the Jews, but rather it's a premeditated crime of self-preservation. It's premeditated. He's hunted by the Jews. He goes into hiding. He's going to die. His disciples are scattered. This is hardly the glorious Christ of whom we have been reading. And yet I would say to you, brethren, this is the glory of Jesus Christ. In fact, the glory of Christ in these next ten or so chapters is coming to a climax in John's gospel. And you think, well, how can that be so? Uh, The ministry is a failure. Our Lord knew differently. John chapter 17 and verse 1, we read these words. And when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come, the hour of his death. The hour has come. What does he say? Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Verse 5, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had before the world existed. He knew that these moments, and what we're seeing is the the shadow of these moments in John 11. He's saying, he, he knows that in these moments, he will bring glory to his Father. Because he's the one who's come to do the will of his Father. And to do it faithfully, to do it sinlessly. He has come to reveal the Father's great love for sinners like you and me. He's come to reveal the Father's holiness, righteousness, justice, mercy, and grace. He's come to reveal the character of his Father, the character of love towards sinners. He has come to glorify the Father, but he also knows that in his life and his suffering and death, the Father is going to glorify him. Glorify your son, he says, as the hour of his death is approaching. The center point, brethren, of history is about to take place in John's gospel. That center point is Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. It's the fulcrum of salvation. Even in his humiliation, even in his death of curse, Jesus is revealed as the one who has come to do the Father's will. His love is made manifest for you, dear friend. His love is made manifest in that he willingly took this charge from his Father that he would die in your place. Here, brethren, we see the deep, deep love of Jesus. Vast, unmeasured boundless and free. Here in this text we see the obedient son, the true Israel, the last Adam, the beloved son in whom his father was well pleased, the one who has come to save sinners from sin and unite them to himself by faith. Therein is glory. Glory, glory through suffering, glory through trial, even glory 
in death. The great irony of John's gospel, the moment of greatest curse is also the moment of greatest glory. Do you know what else he says in John 17 and verse 22? He says this, The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, his disciples, his brethren, that they may be one even as we are one. To share this glory, brethren, which Christ gives his people, you must walk the same path as your Lord and as your Saviour. I want to say this very carefully, brethren. The kind of sufferings of which we are speaking now, and actually I think we can say for the Christian every kind of suffering, listen carefully, every kind of suffering for the Christian is not a proof that God does not love you, rather a proof that he does love you. It is not proof against the love of God in your life, but it is proof positive of God's love in your life. Because even when your suffering is as a result of your own sin, that's the chastening hand of God. You know what the Bible says? The Lord chastens those whom he loves. If I can say it in as careful a way as possible, knowing that many of you have suffered, are suffering, and we all will suffer, there is a sense in which we ought to rejoice and delight in sufferings. Not because the suffering itself is easy or pleasant, but because we know it is yielding in us the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Oh, this is a paradigm shift in your thinking. Your suffering is not a mark against you. It's a mark that you have entered into the life and experience of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because you have faith in him. But our Lord's glory does not end at his death. Far from it, brethren. He's not still in a grave. He's not on a cross. He's been lifted up to the highest heaven, and he sits at the right hand of the majesty on high. He was raised and sits in glory, as you also will, dear friend, if you are united to Christ by faith. Raised from the sufferings of this age. The sufferings, Paul says, of this age are not worthy to be compared with the glories that will be revealed in us. As great as your suffering is now, it cannot be compared with the glory that you will experience in eternity. Look beyond your circumstances. Look to the one who has ordered the circumstances. In a sense, don't look with these eyes, but look with the eyes of faith and you will see your almighty God, your loving Savior who has lived and died for you, who loves you more than you love yourself and will always, always, always do what is right and good for his children. By faith, apprehend that truth, brethren, above every other truth, that your God is good and he has promised good to me. Let's pray. Most blessed and glorious God, teach us, Lord God, your way of truth, that from it we may not depart. For we desire, Lord God, to step in the pathway of our Savior, even at great cost in this age, knowing, Lord, that great cost in this age will yield abundant fruit and riches in the life to come. Oh, be glorified in us, Lord God, as your Son prayed. Be glorified in and by us as we face each day, each trial. Shape our faith that we might turn, Lord God, from these trials. Have mercy upon us, work in us, be gracious to us and bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.